afternoon, everyone. Hi, I'm Anaïs Rameau. I'm a laryngologist at Twelve Cornell, which means that I'm an ENT surgeon who specializes in the voice box. Myophonics is the future of voice rehabilitation. The other co-founder is uh, Professor Fei Wang, who's also in the audience and who can also answer technical questions. Can you imagine living without your voice? This is my grandfather. My grandfather was a poet. He was also a smoker, and unfortunately, he developed cancer of the vocal cords. Luckily enough, he didn't need to have his whole voice box removed, but only part of it. When he came out of the operating room, he looked exactly the same, but as soon as he started talking, he had lost his voice, and he no longer sounded the same, which meant he could no longer read his poetry to his friends and family. His story really affected me and led me to choose my, my field of specialization and also motivated me to find a solution for patients like him. The most, most extreme case of patients without a voice are patients who have their voice box removed. They're called laryngectomy patients. These patients have very limited voice rehabilitation options. In fact, there have been no evolution in that field since the 1980s. This is what they sound like. Obviously, this is really isolating and also stigmatizing. These patients constitute just a small portion of patients who have voice problems. There are about 50,000 of them living in the US right now. There are many other patients with voice problems. This includes about 100,000 patients undergoing a tracheostomy every year. About 350,000 patients having a stroke have half of their face paralyzed and are no longer able to communicate clearly. This is Sandy, a patient from Roosevelt Island we met through Cornell Tech. She's a lovely lady with amazing support system, but she's, very, she's having such a hard time being understood because of her difficulty articulating. Then about a million patients get intubated every year in the ICU. When they have a tube between their vocal cords, they have no voice, which means that they have to communicate using a board. And they get really frustrated because when they seek help, they cannot get the attention they need. And finally, about 18 million Americans every year have a voice issue. Some of them are performers or teachers, and they come to our clinic with voice problems, and they need to be on voice rest for extended periods of time. So we created Myophonics. Myophonics is a wearable device that you hold to your face just like a cell phone. It covers the muscles of articulation of the face and the neck. Electric activity of these muscles are then collected by this device and run through an algorithm that transforms this data into heard speech or a written transcript. Yes. No. We're able to do this thanks to the amazing work of uh, Faye, who has been able to create an algorithm that is able to transform uh, this data into recognized speech. Currently, we're, uh, we have recognized speech for the 10 digits using two subjects, which is superior to our main competitors, Alter Ego, based in Boston and out of MIT Media Lab. We've had a few successes, including winning the 2018 Wild Cornell Hackathon, which led to federal funding and also the submission of a provisional patent. And I want to thank CTL for helping us out with that. Um, and finally, we were part of uh, eLab NYC this past year. eLab NYC is a com competitive accelerator through the city of New York and sponsored initially by Bloomberg. This is how we plan to sell Myophonics. Myophonics will come at a one-time cost of $5,000. Why $5,000? Because other rehabilitation devices, such as hearing aids, are usually priced in that range. In addition, there will be an accompanying app that will cost $25 per month as a subscription. Um, we think that with just capturing 1% of the market, which is about 3 million patients currently in the US, and only a quarter of those being new patients, we would be able to have an annual, annualized sale of 500 million. This is where we are. We already have a publication that's um, just last week we heard that our first paper was accepted by Head & Neck, the premier peer-reviewed journal from Head & Neck Oncology. We also presented this work at the American Laryngological Association a few months ago, and we have our provisional patent. Our next steps are to really better understand our patients, work towards an SBIR and an FDA 510K, and then finally hit the market around 2023 to 2025. This is our team. Again, um, this, uh, there is me, Fei Wang, and uh, we also have Tal as a designer. Thank you.
So of all, of all these markets, which one is your beachhead and why? Which one is, or sorry? Is your beachhead. What market do you enter first? What use case do you enter first? So initially we were motivated to help uh, laryngectomy patients, but it's a very small patient population. So we think that actually targeting ICU patients would be a much better place to start. Um, and also we have uh, created a vocabulary that we want to make available to these patients. Um, it's also a much larger population, and, it's, um, and we would be able to do the trial through, uh, through our New York Presbyterian. And, and would you also address that particular market with the upfront device cost of $5,000? No, this would be different. So if we go through the FDA 510K, eventually we would be selling directly to hospitals, and probably uh, the price of the device would change. Uh, the reason I also mentioned the consumer price is because there are many consumer applications of a device. Obviously, in uh, the area of VR, this would be a way to communicate silently in the virtual world. Um, great, uh, really cool company. Uh, one of the I'm investor. I'm an investor in a company that connects uh, students with um, speech pathology issues with speech therapists um, and also stroke victims. Um, a big component of their success is um, utilizing people to uh, engage. Uh, how do you think about engagement with your medical device? Uh, is that part of your business model yet, or is it uh, Absolutely. something you're relying on the, the, the provider to do on their own? So uh, currently, speech pathologists are involved in both uh, the insertion of voice prosthesis and also uh, the rehabilitation of the voice, and there are CPT codes that are associated. So we want to actually engage the speech pathologists in providing these devices and also teaching uh, not only the medical staff but also patients how to use them. So um, patients are, um, or people will definitely be involved in uh, introducing users to the product. Thank you. This is a great Great product. Um, I know you talked initially about um, going through the ICU. Um, how do you envision a direct to consumer, or how do you envision hospitals or medical providers prescribing this sort of device? Um, so um, there are already CPT codes, and voice rehabilitation is part of what speech pathologists do, and speech path pathologists are active um, agents within the hospital, so that would be one way of introducing the device to, um, to the patient population within the hospitals. But also, currently, there are really not many options for ICU patients, so I think that uh, patients and caregivers are going to love it because it's very frustrating right now for ICU patients to try to write on a piece of paper or point on a very limited set of vocabulary on the board. Is there, is there, um, is there a, a range of severity? Of, is it lack of voice completely? Or if it's a certain level of destruction to the voice, that this could also kind of help bridge the gap to being understood? It can help anyone who wants to use the device. Um, you can use silent speech to be understood. So let's say if you have hoarseness and it's painful to use your voice, you could temporarily use the device to help you communicate during that time period. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.